So, yeah, hello, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Um, it's great to have so many of you with us. And, and I think this is quite an important topic that we're wishing to cover today. Um, we're looking to focus on late effects and coping and living with late effects and understanding late effects with leukemia treatments, acute leukemia treatments. So that's another thing I'd like to point out. This is primarily looking to focus on high intensity and curative leukemia treatments and other leukemia treatments that people may have. And uh, Lisa and Caitlin will help to, dis to define late effects and long-term effects. There's an element of crossover, obviously, with both of these. And I just want to um, thank everybody for joining. This is the third in a series of webinars that we've run with the team at the Christie Hospital in Manchester. So it's a, it's a privilege to have um, Lisa and Caitlin with us today to cover this topic with you. This is your webinar. This is your opportunity, really. If you've got any burning questions, if you've got issues, or if you're having uh, problems, um, we can't be too specific and prescriptive with answers, but this is really about raising awareness and understanding of what your challenges may be or are, or if you aren't yet, you know, possibilities to be aware of without thinking that everything might happen to you because there's such a range of possible late effects or long-term effects and they're very individual. So this isn't about scaring people. This is really about giving you a forum and giving you understanding and trying to signpost you and, and help you with managing these, these effects. So my name's Nick. Um, I'm part of Leukemia Care's advocacy team. And we're joined today, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, I think I've covered the, uh, if you could please use chat to post any questions. It's not as participative as other sessions might be. On the slides you will have seen, and you will at the end when we talk out, that we have some more opportunities for you to join with others in national support groups that might be relevant to your type of um, acute leukemia, or if you wish to join a, a group of peers from uh, with bone marrow transplant experience, there you'll have a greater opportunity to connect with others and be more participative. But we'll try to make this as particip participative as possible. Just to let you know that this session is also being streamed live to Facebook. So viewers uh, who have joined us on Facebook, my colleague in the background is uh, able to pick up your questions that you may have for Lisa and Caitlin. So please do pop those in the discussion below this session, um, that, you know, below the video screen in Facebook, and these will be dropped over to us so that uh, Lisa and Caitlin can can address those and you can effectively join this conversation. Um, it's a 60 minute webinar, so I'll try not to talk too much, but obviously this is quite a poorly understood situation. And, uh, you know, this, this is your webinar to try and address what many don't understand that obviously once you have gone through those initial stages of, to, you know, difficult stages of preparing for your treatment and then um, the effects that you've had to deal with during treatment, that it's not over for many of you. And this is really what this session is about, is to help you with coping with that. So without further ado, may I introduce you to Lisa and Caitlin. And if, Caitlin, if you could take it from here and um, give your overview talk and introduce yourselves, please. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, hi everybody. I think we just wanted to do our introductions face to face before we do our slideshow. Um, just so that you can sort of see who we are really. So my name's Lisa and um, hi, I'm Caitlin. Caitlin. And uh, we basically work within here at the haematology department in the Christie. And um, between us, we've got quite a number of years within this speciality. Um, and we tend to work, we are clinical nurse specialists within this field. So we tend to work with a different variety of patient groups across the haematology setting. Um, specifically, based with the different types of leukemias and then patients that go on to transplantation as well. So we really first want to just thank Leukemia and Care, obviously for inviting us to speak to you today. Um, we do understand, as Nick said, that you know this is quite a broad subject. 
Um, so we're just going to give a brief overlay of our um, slides for you and then hope that we can get some participation from you. Because obviously for us as well, you know, this is a really good opportunity for us to just sort of connect and learn from patients as well, because, you know, it's a very complex process for everybody. And obviously, you know, we feel quite privileged to have the opportunity to hear from the patients and, and obviously what you might be experiencing through your treatment pathway. So if it's OK, I'm just gonna, we're just going to share our slides and we'll go through those first. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. Okay, so we're just going to be discussing obviously coping with the late effects of acute leukemia treatment and um, specifically just with um, treatment regimes with the plan for curative effect and also just touching on transplant as well. So what we hope to achieve by just going through this talk with you today is obviously we want to try and define late effects um, because we do tend to find that it can be quite a confusing subject, particularly when what we, how we classify what a late effect is, when that might occur, and obviously just some of the, um, the points surrounding treatment and what's available to you to manage these. Um, we want to be able to gain a better understanding of those long term effects because they are not as well documented or recorded as some of our acute effects throughout our um, treatments. And obviously look at the causes and how these could be possibly managed and then obviously try and hopefully sort of signpost or highlight some of the coping strategies and other support that's available to you. So what is a late effect? So if we're going to look at the definition of a long term effect, it's a side effect that can happen during your treatment, but continue for some time afterwards. So we would be talking about things like neuropathy, um, related weaknesses, numbness, pain, fatigue, obviously um, sexual uh, considerations and also um, elevated anxieties and depressions. So we then kind of move on to late effects, which are side effects that can occur months or years after completing your treatment. So a long term effect, if I can go back to it again, is something that happens during your treatment, but occurs for a long period of time. Whereas a late effect is a side effect that it can occur months or years after completing your treatment. And these would develop as a consequence of the effects of the treatment you've had on obviously one of potentially an organ system or the psychological process. As we've discussed before, um, there can be quite a crossover as to what a late effect is. So sometimes it may be a lot of treatment pathways are classified between acute side effects and late effects. But it is sometimes possible to have this crossover period in your recovery where you can develop an acute effect in a in a what would be considered a late part of your recovery. So although we're going to talk about late effects today, it's just worth mentioning um, mentioning that this can happen at any point throughout your treatment. The risks of developing a late effect can depend on certain types of elements that are related to your treatment program. So dose of treatments, sometimes it is being documented that if you have had um, several treatment pathways or several chemotherapy regimes, you know, then sometimes that would increase your chance of developing late effects. It can also be related to the type of treatment you have. There are definitely particular regimes or transplant conditioning um, therapies that would increase the possible chances of late effects. And also age. Sometimes age um, can increase your chances of potential side effects. So just at the point in when you're accessing your treatment or having that long, uh, that curative treatment, sometimes that can help. Um, just increase those chances slightly. What I would like to mention is that obviously 
the medical teams at EC will, can advise you on the potential risks of long-term effects, but it can be really difficult to predict who would be affected by these and who wouldn't. A bit, as I'm sure you've experienced before, throughout your whole treatment pathway, it's an extremely individual process. Um, and depending on what side effects you may experience is really down to your own physiology. So I just want to be mindful that obviously we may discuss a lot of late effects, but as Nick said, I would like to stress that it doesn't necessarily mean that you would experience any of them. Um, there is a lot of focus on side effects during treatment, but we don't seem to see much on the late effects. And it is something particularly within our roles we're very aware of, because obviously as a key worker for um, patients, we do tend to see them more once they're discharged, when they're going home, and when they're on that road to recovery. So we do tend to find that the late effects and the advice given um, sometimes isn't as optimal or isn't as available as maybe some of the acute side effects that are often discussed in consent and before you come into treatment. And I think it's really important to obviously have these discussions like today so that we can all build awareness as treatments develop throughout um, leukemia. Uh, leukemia care, you do tend to find that, you know, with some of the targeted therapies that are coming into our, into our circle of treatment, and as, you know, we can sort of specialise these targeted therapies, then we would hope that over time we'll see a decrease in these late effects. But it is really important to acknowledge they still, still occur and how much it can affect, you know, everybody who's individually having to receive chemotherapy treatment. So I'm just going to hand yeah. over to Caitlin. <clears throat> so um, what we thought would be quite useful is just to obviously start by kind of outlining some of the possible physical late and long term effects. Um, so we can talk kind of briefly through each one of these, but obviously, you know, if we want to kind of uh, revisit any of these and create a bit more of a discussion, then that's, you know, that's absolutely fine. So. Um, I thought I'd start by just obviously mentioning fatigue, you know, fatigue is one of the most common long term side effects um, that people having had treatment can experience um, it can affect people physically and also cognitively. You know, a lot of people describe it as an extreme tiredness or feeling of exhaustion, and it can have a really negative impact on all aspects of day to day life, whether that's personal care, social activities, or disruption to work because of things like brain fog, sorry, brain fog, uh, lack of concentration, not being able to find the words. Um, and I guess, you know, it's just really important to highlight that, you know, that there are strategies and coping um, mechanisms that um, are available and, you know, people can employ these to help manage and gain more control of their day-to-day -day roles and responsibilities so as i said you know it's always important to report this symptom and we can visit some of those strategies a bit later on in discussion and so the next side effect that um we've obviously popped down here are some treatments that we give can obviously affect um the heart and lungs and they can cause um some changes now, most of the side effects associated with um, the heart and lungs um, are normally short lived, um, reversible, and they disappear after treatment. However, some of the side effects can only develop months or years after treatment has stopped. And again, I think there'll be quite a common theme throughout this presentation, but a lot of it is dependent on what treatment you've had what dose of drugs you've had and what age you were around having that treatment and also whether any treatment was given in combination with something like radiotherapy. Um, just um, moving on to nerve changes. Um, so a long-term effect of quite a few treatments which we see in an acute leukemia um, pathway um, can cause symptoms of peripheral, neuro sorry, peripheral neuropathy. And what this is, is it basically causes damage or dysfunction to the nerves. And you may find if you're experiencing this symptom that you get tingling, numbness, weakness, pain to the affected areas. And it can be quite common in hands and feet. 
And, and I guess all we would kind of want to kind of be advising patients on with this is, you know, if you are having those certain drugs um, that make you more susceptible to getting something like peripheral neuropathy, it's just really important to be raising those um, symptoms so your medical team are aware and, you know, they can do things like adjusting doses to relieve some of those symptoms. Um, so moving on, endocrine and thyroid. So this can be quite a, a big subject. So I thought by just kind of covering, well, what is the endocrine system? What does it do? So the endocrine system is made up of organs and glands, which basically um, help produce hormones to control body function. They control how your body generates energy, growth, sleep, development and reproduction. So there are certain treatments that we give within acute leukemia that can lead to some temporary and some permanent um, damage to some of the components within the system. And this can lead to things like early menopause, infertility and underactive thyroid. I'm sure a lot of you are aware um, the thyroid gland is what helps your body um, produce thyroxine, which helps metabolize. Um, and obviously, when uh, patients have underactive thyroids, they're unable to produce that hormone. So a lot of the management around that can be just supporting with medication and close monitoring. I thought it'd be useful to talk through uh, very broadly about body image as well. You know, if you think about some of the treatments that we give within acute leukemia, they can cause some physical changes, which can influence people's feelings about their sexuality and their sexual appeal. Um, certain body changes um, that we sometimes see include weight gain, weight loss, changes in skin colour, hair loss, hormonal changes, energy levels, fatigue. Um, and that kind of, you know, that needs, um, you know, obviously reporting to your local team and you know, there are plenty of strategies and services that we can signpost to to help support patients when they're going through these changes. Um, so we will mention um, fertility um, and obviously it, it can be, you know, quite a emotive um, subject. And, you know, there's a lot of information that we can talk about today uh, with regards to fertility, you know, it can affect um, males as well as females. Um, certain treatments that we give, uh, particularly with males, can slow um, or stop the production of sperm. Um, and likewise, in females, um, it can have some effects on the ovarian function. Um, now, obviously, this is dependent again on what treatments you have, what dose um, of certain drugs you're given and a lot of it is um, down to age as well so with males in particular um, you know if it is a temporary late effect it just is important to highlight that the recovery can be um, quite slow really and can take some time um, I know Lisa is going to be talking in a bit more detail um, in relation to this in terms of having conditioning and potential radiotherapy through transplantation. So we will we will revisit this subject and talk about the importance of discussing uh, this topic pre-treatment. So moving on to secondary cancers again, you know, it can be again a very emotive subject, but I guess we just want to highlight that, you know, the risks are minimal and it's all about you know being honest and aware and open in your follow-up um, clinics following treatment and raising any specific concerns that you may have you know your medical team uh, prior to starting treatment and after can discuss with you in more detail about risk factors um, after specific drugs um, or treatment regimes that you may have been given um, so just the last couple we'll touch on very briefly. So some treatments um, can cause changes um, to the eyes. Um, people can develop cataracts and they can also um, 
experience very kind of dry, irritable eyes. Um, if radiotherapy is part of um, certain people's treatment regime, you know, there is um, a risk that it can affect hearing and it can cause hear loss. Mouth changes can also include things like dryness, um, dental issues, um, including things like tooth loss. Um, in terms of skin and nail changes, again, um, that could be um, things like dryness to the skin, discoloration to the nails, swelling, redness around the site. And in terms of um, bone and joint issues, um, I guess alongside a lot of treatments that we give, and again, Lisa's going to go into this in more detail, um, but steroids can play quite a big role in a lot of our treatment pathways. And sometimes um, when taking steroids, you know, it can affect um, your bone function and make your bones slightly more brittle. Um, so patients can obviously experience some pain and discomfort around that. Um, and I guess, you know, in terms of management and action plans, what we want to really highlight today is just how important it is to be raising this to your treatment centre or your GP. Um, it's all about being able to assess these symptoms further, further investigating them, you know, coming up with treatment plans, you know, referring to specialist fields, um, and essentially just making sure that you're followed up in the correct way. Um, as I said before, there are that is a lot of information, and we're happy to kind of um, revisit any of those specific side effects in more details during our discussion. So I'm just going to talk a little bit more about the late effects um, following transplantation. And again, you know, because the chemotherapy conditioning very much consists of high dose chemotherapy, just as it does for some of the acute curative um, leukemia pathways, a lot of these side effects are very similar, but you do tend to find with transplant, they have slightly different aspects within them. So one of the longer, um, I'd say it's a long-term effect of transplant would obviously be as a result of the treatment, um, there would be that low level of immunity. And that tends to be slightly different from the high dose chemotherapies where you receive chemotherapy and your immune system is lowered. And then throughout a period of time, that then increases into your recovery and your immunity should be sort of restored within a period of time. Transplant is slightly different purely because of the intense um, myeloblative conditioning that we give. You do tend to find that you, um, by having the conditioning, it will lower the immunity for a period of time within sort of the best part of the year following treatment. So immunity um, is a real issue for some people for a considerable amount of time after transplant and something that has to be sort of carefully monitored. Because of the immune suppression, um, and obviously the treatment, you do tend to find that any antibodies or any immunity that you previously acquired throughout your life will have gone. Whereas with the high dose chemotherapy, some of those antibodies are still present. So with transplant, there is obviously the issues about building that immunity up, which takes a longer period of time. And obviously then re uh, required revaccination programs. Normally, particularly with our centre, we sort of tend to do those a year after treatment. So levels of immunity are, can be a potential issue. And then obviously the, the big one would be graft versus host disease. And again, you know, as me and Caitlin have said, these topics are quite big. Um, so, you know, we could spend a lot more time talking about this, but just as an overview, with transplantation, obviously we would be looking at the effects, of, the long-term effects of graft versus host disease. And you do, they again, it's classified as acute and chronic, but there does tend to be quite an overlap as to when these happen. We tend to have follow-up um, clinics here at the Christie for late effects transplant, which normally happens a year after treatment, just because you can still find that some of these side effects will present themselves within sort of, you know, two years post-transplant. And again, when we talk about it, like all these side effects, you know, the, the level or severity or time it would take to treat or, you know, present with these, these uh, long-term effects are really individualized. Some people might not experience any of these at all. Other people, it could be, you know, a really 
difficult um, sort of road to recovery in terms of managing them. So with the graft versus host disease, what we're looking at is obviously that the graft is particularly strong and is then identifying the other cells within your body, like your skin or gut, um, liver, that type of thing is unusual. And it tends to sort of cause the graft cells to sort of ha uh, have a response to them and cause quite a lot of inflammation. And it can be quite a debilitating issue for a lot of our patients that does require um, quite a lot of follow up. Um, we also would look at sort of uh, rehab and physio programs are really good, particularly with skin GVHD. Um, we would also look at there is a series of medications or treatment plans that we would initiate if that was ever going to be possible. Um, and also just looking at, you know, uh, well, um, well-being clinics uh, for women we have here that's quite a, a long term one. And obviously that's something we'd like to look into for men as well. In terms of bones, again, as Caitlin touched on, that very much comes down to sometimes the level of steroid that is introduced into your treatment pathway. And particularly if it's something that you need to access as part of, you know, late effects um, to manage symptoms. And again, with, with any of our medications, as you will all be more aware so than, than myself and Caitlin, you know, all medications tend to come with a price or a side effect. So sometimes a lot of it is managing you know, when we talk about late effects, it's managing those other symptoms that then come along with trying to treat these. One that that falls into is definitely the bones. Obviously, the steroids can affect um, the bone density. Um, and sometimes there is something called AVN or acute vascular necrosis that some people might experience in very minimal numbers that would could sometimes affect bones, etc. that we then have to look into specialist areas such as orthopedics and things like that to look at how can us manage those symptoms for our patients. And again, fertility, um, as Caitlin said, you know, it, it's a major issue for a lot of our patients. Um, we would always uh, hope that fertility, the options of preservation and storage, if available, would um, have been discussed with you or when you went into your treatment regimes and you know there is always that issue of how fast or how acutely we need to start treatment so sometimes these things you know um and maybe uh, are not available to everybody at that point. But what we would really suggest is that, the, you know, there are a lot of um, family planning advice available for patients, um, particularly patients who have received um, cancer treatments. We would always recommend, you know, there are a lot of elements that would influence that as to, to what fertility status was before. And a lot of the time we don't have information about that. So we would really just encourage, you know, if those questions are still um, being posed for you to talk to your transplant teams and also, you know, to speak to your GPs about what available um, services there are to you within your, your area. Um, and I think also, you know, again, I just want to touch on that we talk about there's a whole list of late effects that we've listed there that at times can kind of sound quite daunting when they're in black and white. But we would say that, you know, a lot, if you are experiencing any of these symptoms, it's really good that, you know, we're all trying to raise that awareness, but they also could be, you know, linked to another condition or another, you know, episode of acute um, infection or anything that could be very easily treatable and not related to the treatment. So it's about getting that identification by the right people speaking to the specialists who are looking after you and allowing them to guide you as to what's the best course of actions to get these managed and um, treated and then obviously followed up with. So again, I'm just going to pass over to Caitlin just to look at some of the psychological late effects of, of treatment. Yeah, so um, obviously many people experience you know a wide mixture of emotions after treatment and everyone will cope quite differently you know as we've mentioned we've touched on very you know kind of emotive um possible late and long-term side effects um you know ending ending of treatment survivorship it all involves um you know a series of adjustments as you come to terms with what you've been through and start to think about your life moving forward um you know, late effects can have quite a negative impact on um, your quality of life. 
um, whether that's down to functionality, physical restriction. Um, sometimes people can have feelings of um, anxiety, altered mood. Um, relationships can change, social networks can change. You know, after spending periods of time in hospital, you know, people can develop a loss of independence. People sometimes describe the feeling of feeling like a stranger in their own home, you know, that they don't quite belong, that they notice things are done slightly differently. Um, and it, it might feel that sometimes, you know, people's usual role within the family has been lost or taken over by someone else. Um, and again, you know, sometimes it can be hard to maintain those um, wider relationships to your social networks. And sometimes, you know, your relationships with friends do change. Um, in terms of, um, you know, having gone through such a, an intense period of treatment um, where you know, you're surrounded by professionals and other people who know exactly what you're going through and who understand completely, you know, where you're up to with things. Sometimes people can feel, you know, a little bit kind of abandoned and isolated once they finish treatment. Sometimes you expect to feel elated, um, but a lot of people do experience almost a bit of an anticlimax when they finish treatment. But obviously there's quite a lot of uncertainty once you have gone through such a such a massive, um, you know, kind of period of time um, in your life, such an intensity of treatment, you know, there is always uncertainty and fear of, you know, reoccurrence. Um, you know, after a long period of um, a treatment, as I said, close monitoring, you may feel as though nothing's being done to keep the disease at bay, which can lead again to more anxiety. We touched on some of the physical changes um, surrounding body image and, you know, there are a lot of psych psychological, um, you know, impacts in relation to some of those changes. Um, and I guess it's just important to know that, you know, there are lots of coping mechanisms and support groups out there. Um, to, to help you really. So some of the coping, the coping mechanisms, some of the key ones, which again, we can touch on in a bit more detail, you know, the benefits of doing physical activity, um, learning some relaxation techniques and ways of managing your thoughts. You know, it's really important to be kind to yourself and recognize, you know, everything that you've gone through and, you know, to try and have open conversations with, you know, your family and friends you know, there is going to be a period of adjustment and this period of adjustment isn't short, you know, things might have to change and, you know, some adaptations might have to be put in place to help you move forward with life. There are some, you know, if you're finding it quite difficult to talk to um, family and friends, there are lots of ways where, um, you know, you can talk to a professional, whether that's through something like cognitive behavioural therapy or counselling sessions. Um, I guess as we're doing today, we're all coming together um, for discussions and awareness and, you know, to listen to each other about any concerns we have. Leukemia Care and other charities also have a lot of extra support groups um, available and online forums that, um, you know, give people an opportunity to talk to others who have been through similar situations. Um, I have put complementary health and wellbeing um, there. So at the Christie's, we've got... Um, our complementary health and wellbeing team and they do a you know they provide an amazing service for patients and their relatives and um, not only do they you know support patients with um, coping with anxiety and going through stress management techniques um, they can also offer therapeutic um, massages to patients and their relatives um, so I think Again, that's just kind of a whistle stop tour through some of those things, and we can address that in more detail during our discussion. So we did obviously just some of the resources there that we won't necessarily talk to, but they're obviously there for your research um, and obviously reference if you do want to access any of them. So obviously first point of call, we would say was your treatment centre. And also, you know, to key into um, such as ourselves, if you have a, a clinical nurse specialist or a key worker available, they will really be able to help you um, signpost you to some of those services. We're aware that, you know, the, these are quite limited in recent years, particularly with 
the effects of COVID, etc. That contact with people hasn't been as available as it used to. But I do feel, you know, I don't know if Caitlin feels the same, but in the last couple of months, particularly in the last sort of six months, things seem to be opening up, up a lot more yeah, to what's available really. and sort of having that face to face contact, I think, really sort of helps. So obviously, you know, Leukemia Care as well offers some great services like the Buddy Services. Um, we also have one in Greater Manchester that's um, a sort of, they call it a chemotherapy prehab um, service, which you can access and sort of get um, not just sort of acute um, pre-treatment symptoms, but they also manage and offer sort of guidance for sort of long-term um cancer patients who maybe need help or can access sort of um, gym memberships that mm -hmm. type of thing um so otherwise as we said you know the online forums and obviously looking at sort of any sort of survivorship courses and having that readjustment and i think when we talk about late effects it's also worth mentioning you know it is sometimes i think there's the opposite end of the spectrum um, maybe some patients may feel that, you know, they've had so much time spent with us that uh, if they do experience any symptoms of late effects, they actually don't want to come back yeah. to the treatment centre, you know, and they actually think that, you know, I'd rather, you know, because of what that that time in your your life means to you that actually it's not always easy to sort of come back or raise another issue that you think might then lead to further treatment so we do recognize that but obviously we would just advise that you know the earlier we can detect these things then sometimes they, it makes it a little bit more manageable so I just really want to say, you know, again, we'd like to say thank you very much for listening. And um, we understand that there is a lot of information. I think overall, I think what, you know, the subject of late effects and long-term effects needs is better data collection, um, maybe more of a focus, you know, from a medical point of view, from the accumulation of research and evidence. Um, just so that by getting a better understanding of what um, you have as patients are experiencing, um, then allows us to, you know, sort of look at better prevention and treatment strategies and obviously future care as well. You know, it would be really nice to hear what your thoughts are on this from our perspective and how we deliver our service. Um, so again, we'd just like to like to say thank you and um, obviously open it up, uh, open up any questions to yourselves. Yeah. So we'll um, just stop sharing now. Well, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Caitlin. You certainly um, covered a lot of ground there, and there's a lot of yeah. food for thought for everybody. We have got quite a few questions uh, or, or shared experiences in in different coming from different directions. Um, Facebook. We've also got a couple that maybe we can also have a look at, and some of these. Um, Maybe we can talk it a little bit more in terms of explanation. But I think the one thing that struck me straight away was the disconnect that you mentioned, that many patients mentioned post-treatment, post a couple of years or a year down the road where they're out there, people are moving on with their life, isolated, they're experiencing long-term effects or late effects emerge. You guys are a fantastic centre of excellence at the Christie. You sound as if you have a terrific support uh, network around you and you remain quite connected with your patients. Mm -hmm. Am I getting this right? That I mean, from the point of view, if, pe if people are experiencing effects, um, mm -hmm. who, that they, you know, how can people push to help with addressing these? I mean, one of the points I can say is the charity Leukemia Care is very much mm -hmm. here to help patients and our um, patient advocacy service, and I'll come to those on slides at the end, if if you're experiencing issues or experiencing issues of not being able to get the support, then the mm -hmm. charity can very, very much help you with there. And if you've got day-to-day -day issues and you're not connected with your care team because you've been somewhat removed for many years, on mm -hmm. our helpline, we have two resident clinical nurse specialists who are expert specialists, clinical nurse specialists with special interest in acute leukemia and transplant areas, as well as the support team who can help you there. But you mentioned GPs and primary care. Is that what you're seeing as the most immediate route 
for everybody or or do you experience a variation there are people able to reconnect with their hematology team and their care team some years on i know you mentioned there people might not be feel nervous about it but what what Mm -hmm. do you see because you're obviously involved with your nursing community across the uk what is the guidance there to help people push i think yeah i think um from that perspective i think obviously you know we're we're very aware that we're a very established team here and we do do already quite a lot of late effects or follow-up so we do realize that we probably stay in contact maybe with some of our patients longer than other centers i think it's always a fine balance because obviously from a from a nurse in a medical perspective you know we kind of i suppose in a way maybe make wrong assumptions that you know patients once they've completed their treatment you know probably don't want to have those connections with us you know they want to be moving on so I think sometimes with some centres if you are in a curative point you know where you no longer have any active leukaemia or disease then obviously there is that point of discharge so I do know that a lot of centres do discharge their patients at a certain point I think if you were in the community and and you experienced side effects that you felt were related to your treatment and you had Um, sort of you know maybe looked at today's webinar or other information and felt that you were experiencing those side effects but you no longer had that regular follow-up my advice would be to be a to use your gp first of all because your your gp although at the moment i do understand there's challenges with that is almost you know a gatekeeper to other services for you so if you went and spoke to your gp and said you were having a particular side effect and also you know when you're having that consultation with them highlighted the treatment that you've had and you know very openly say that you know you have um, looked at certain information and it does correlate to potentially being in a a long-term effect of your treatment then your gp is in a position where they should then be able to do a referral letter um, or contact your treating team to see if there is any possibility of getting that reviewed if the GP you know, feels that they're in a position with enough knowledge to be able to treat that, then again, that's another option. Or I would also, you know, always, if you still have, you know, your CNS team, I would still drop them a call. You know, we regularly have patients who may have yeah. had treatment several years ago, but again, you know, just question whether this is something they can, you know, worry about. And we discuss it, we discuss it amongst ourselves mm-hmm. and the medical team. And there are incidences where it doesn't fall it isn't a treatment related side effect but you know I think most centres would be happy to answer those so I think I don't know if I've answered that fully but my first point of call would be GP and and also just highlight you know the treatment you've been under and they can always re-refer you back to your treatment centre if your GP feels that that's something that they need more specialist advice on. Thanks, Lisa. I think that that gives people some direction. And and you did touch in your talk earlier that peer support, peer support groups, yeah, being in yeah. contact with others, buddy schemes, things of that nature are probably even more valuable because you've got a more shared experience of lived experience mm-hmm. and people are able to also share how they deal with these issues and what services have helped those. Yeah. And I'm mindful that, you know, that somebody has posted a very kind question that's been isolated for some 20 years and feels very alone in that. So that's, Mm. I think uh, the slides that we will present, uh, I'll present in a little while, will hopefully help connect you with others. Mm. I think that's a really important part of this as well. It's being connected with a community that you can dip into and drop out again Mm. so you can get on with your normal life. But if yeah. you are experiencing an issue, you can at least connect with others that might understand. And I notice a um, good friend Ross has just posted uh, as well that um, you know he's lived for a long time, long time since his treatments, and and it, it, you know um, with many others are there in the communities to help each other. Um, mm-hmm. I just wanted to touch on some questions. You mentioned peripheral neuropathy. That's quite a long mm-hmm. word. And okay. um, I, bear with me a second. I'm trying to navigate around um, all these different buttons here. Um, somebody from Facebook, um, you know, has, has talked about having lots of numbness in their hands and, okay. and feet and pain and their skin's feeling very tight. Um, mm-hmm. 
you know, I have to allude that myself, I'm a different type of leukemia patient. I'm a chronic patient, so I'm familiar with some of these things. Um, do you have any advice? I mean, are these the type of symptoms that somebody should push very hard to see somebody about? Is, mm. are, you mentioned about peripheral neuropathy as yeah. an explanation for some of these pains. Are, are these potentially long term? Are these other ways of easing this? Um, are there strategies or is this something that somebody would need clinical support with and need to talk to their doctor about? I think it, you know, it absolutely sounds um, very reasonable to be trying to raise these, um, you know, a, a symptoms with either your local treatment centre. I mean, it would be interesting to know uh, whether that person was obviously you know, how long were they out of treatment? Are they currently having treatment? How easy it is to be able to communicate that with someone. But as I mentioned, you know, obviously uh, with something like peripheral neuropathy, um, you know, we hope that it is a temporary long-term side effect. Um, but I guess, you know, if if that person is still receiving treatment, um, then it, you know, it is- This person's 14 months post-treatment, so. Oh, yeah, okay, it's okay. Yeah. So um, it's, Again, I would say that that's pretty much something that should be raised. Yeah. I mean, again, it's it's really difficult with any list of symptoms because there can obviously be a, as we would say, a differential diagnosis or so a different underlying cause. So I would, I think, first point mm -hmm. of call again is if that person, if you're not being able, if you're not having regular follow up still um, with your local team, I would go to your GP. Obviously, there's other conditions that can cause numbness and pain, particularly to hands and feet. Um, so I would probably get those ruled out as well. Um, and then maybe if it was a continued issue, um, neuro, neuropathic pain caused by sort of chemotherapy agents is quite a well documented thing. Yeah. So, you know, GPs may, there are types of ways of managing it, particularly with um, analgesia and pain relief sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm thinking of a particular medications, but there's certain ones that can help the targets sort of nerve pains. Also, as we said, there's some really good sort of complementary therapies. Yeah. So acupuncture. Yeah, acupuncture yeah. and things has been known to, to help with symptoms Relieving of, symptoms, of yeah. neuropathy. So again, I think my first point of call would be GP to rule out any other potential causes. Mm -hmm. And then obviously speak to your GP about, you know, peripheral neuropathy could it possibly be that because of the side effects of your treatment and again if it's something they can't manage then you know to maybe speak to your treatment center and I guess that you know if that person did still have contact mm. details if they had a key worker if they still could you know reach out to that clinical nurse specialist as well it's always worth just getting in touch and making mm. them aware as well Thank you very much. For that. Um, I'm just going to stay with the same group at the moment because it relates to what we were just talking about. Um, you know, somebody shared that post transport 30 years ago, um, you know, if living with um, the psychological challenges and, and, and mental health effects, then that it's very difficult to connect because there doesn't seem to be anything in place to be able to support this person. I mean, I can comment from the point of view of the charity at Leukemia Care. Leukemia mm -hmm. Care does offer a six session counselling grant for anybody affected by a diagnosis mm -hmm. of leukemia. So um, in the slides at the end of this, uh, of, of this session, I can share that information. And this session is going to be recorded. So every, every information, all of the information on the slides will be available. I mean, that's one route. But you mentioned earlier, Lisa, that um, GPs could be a gateway to this kind of service. Um, have you yeah. any other thoughts? Yeah, again, you know, I mean, again, your GP does have a, you know, is actually trained to manage in, mm -hmm. you know, um, in issues with mental health or, you know, depression and that type of thing. So, again, they would be a first point of call. I think, obviously, as Nick said, you know, um, having worked with this, our patient group for quite some time now, the feelings of isolation and I think it's quite a difficult process and um, treatment plan to kind of really put into words what patients experience so you know that those um, feelings of isolation and things really sort of resonate with us that we can understand why our patients feel in this position I think a lot if I'm honest at the moment as you said I think the charity based yeah. um, 
counselling and psychological yeah. services are probably some of the best ones available if I'm honest. I think I would definitely touch with GP but also then you know maybe use these the some of the charity based um, counselling services sort of a second route because I do feel having that probably more in-depth knowledge um, with the person that you're speaking to to sort of be able to relate to those experiences you know that those experiences of fear and as Caitlin said reoccurrence that comes along with a cancer diagnosis particularly you know when we discuss leukemia and it's it's sort of nature and being quite aggressive you know it, it can feel quite a you know a, a serious period as you said of adjustment you know when we talk about several years you know a lot of our patients find themselves mm -hmm. in that position and you know I think we just need to maybe really sort of you know as the you know the good work that leukemia care is doing is just really sort of highlighting that these things are out there because a lot of the time the patients that contact us you know just find it really difficult to access mm. these things you know to actually pinpoint what is available oh, thanks very much for that input i mean similarly here in the group somebody's also commented 30 years on actually more um you know from treatment in early 70s still suffering with ptsd um yeah. and um i'm long words i'm sorry to Pseudomonas whilst neutropenic has caused some scarring yeah. and um, mm. this person is also desperate to find some relevant support so I think from that point of view I know the charity could help if you're able to get in touch with the charity our advocacy mm. officer could help signpost you to resources there but um, again that's a similar situation that we're hearing this repeatedly that many people that are quite a long way out might have yeah. late effects mm. or long-term effects but have dropped off the support radar so hopefully I can share some slides that will help um, mm. in those. I, I've just had, there is one comment and I've got to apologize for everybody. This, there was a lot of comments and with, you know, hopefully we can address most of them. There is a comment with, from somebody about pediatrics. And I think the majority of mm. everybody on the call are, uh, and, and yourselves, if I'm not right, Caitlin and Lisa, you're in um, adult, adult, adult. Adult. yeah. I don't know if you could offer some words of reassurance or anything of the nature to, to somebody that's just that has posted about somebody that's currently in treatment with a 15 month old doing quite well and he yeah. sort of don't want to scare yeah. the person yeah yeah and what the currently in treatment sorry can you just say that again um yeah apologies i'm i'm trying to navigate my way through um <laughs> all of these quite all of these uh, comments are just coming in at the moment um yeah. wow um yeah, a toddler. In, so, had a, what's the effect for a toddler in long in the long time? My son's sixteen months old with AML diagnosis, due to finish chemotherapy soon, but overall during treatment is doing very well. Um, thanks for an for an answer. Um, I don't think it's anything that you're able to specifically answer, really, is it? Other than offering some. No, I don't. I mean, it's a bit tricky one, really. It's. I mean, obviously, we have. You know, there's a different speciality with paediatrics yeah. with leukemia obviously you know we overall I think that the general feeling is is that you know we tend to have quite positive outcomes yeah. obviously even you know long term I think as, um, pa as patients get older there's obviously this period where late effects could arise um, and I think particularly normally sort of presentations within sort of teenagers mm -hmm. and things like that. And it would be more around about sometimes the effects of the treatment. Um, but again, overall, from my understanding, which I have to admit is very limited within this area, um, it, it tends to be, you know, quite positive. And I guess it's probably just, you know, important to, you know, make sure that, you know, as parents of a 15, yeah. 16 month year old who's undergoing treatment, you know, yeah. what support are they currently receiving? receiving. Can they, yeah. do they, does their child have a key worker? Do they, as a family, they have a key worker? Can they be accessing, you know, support groups with parents who are going through a similar mm. situation? Uh, and again, just accessing those, those charities, those websites where, you, you know, you can be accessing free counselling if needs be. Um, but I, I'm again, like Lisa, you know, paediatrics is not really mm -hmm. our specialty, but, you know, I'd like to think that, you know, there is there is a lot out there. And I guess it's just knowing where to look, isn't it? OK, thank you. I'm just going to part with one last question. There seems to be quite a theme. There are an awful lot of um, 
questions from everybody and and it's obvious that we know that many people are living with long-term effects or late mm. emergence but there's an underlying theme of a lot of bone pain a lot of joint pain a lot mm. of um you know difficulty in movement worrying in those areas are there any specific areas of therapeutic support or support that you can cite but somebody's very kindly mentioned that they've been referred to rheumatology um mm. for an appointment for an x-ray an ultrasound but mm. have you experienced in this area that you're able to offer some, offer some guidance? Yeah, so we, I can, we can really, really talk about maybe patients that present to us with maybe joint in joint joint pain. And again, I must admit, it does, as you've uh, um, as you've reported there, it does tend to be quite a common theme at certain stages for our patients, more sort of late effects. Um, and again, you know, I think it, it is sort of, again, highlighting what those concerns what those issues are because what we wouldn't want to do is got of say a blanket case of well you know maybe some more exercise would help etc again I think you know if people are living with these long-term effects at home to a point where they're experiencing pain and symptoms that are sort of debilitating their quality of life you know then I would really advocate that those people you know really really and I understand the need to sometimes push to access it, you know, their GP surgeries, um, particularly if they're that far out of treatment, because I think it's a little bit more harder, you know, if you're talking 10, 20 years out of treatment, you know, to then try and access transplant services is quite difficult. So I would really then sort of advise to go sort of to your GP, you know, you shouldn't you shouldn't be in a position where you'd be expected to live with these things on a daily basis because you, you know, had your treatment. They should be assessed. They should be seeing, you know, is this an orthopedic um, side effect? You know, is this a side effect of treatment that's, you know, affected the bones? Is it something of, as you said, more of an inflammation or a rheumatoid issue? Because you do tend to find with leukemias that because obviously they're blood bound diseases you do mm -hmm. tend to get quite a lot of inflammation or sometimes autoimmune responses from from sort of you know how how they present with symptoms so i would very much kind of just advocate going to your gp insisting that these are an issue and that you are in significant pain with them allowing them to go through that route of diagnosis and referring to specialized centers because a lot of our patients who do present with sort of joint pain that type of thing our initial feelings would be you know to get you to do an immediate sort of x-ray see if there was any concerns and if there was nothing obvious we then have to delve into those symptoms a little bit deeper and refer to specialist services we do have to refer to to sort of renal specialists, mm. um, orthopedics, yeah. rheumatology. So I think it just kind of, you know, shows how broad the latest effects can be and sometimes how, you know, that other specialist centres to help treat these symptoms is, is what's needed. Thank you, Lisa. I'm going to draw things to a close because it's clear that, as you just said, more, more people are sharing side effects than mm. they're having to live with. Um, you know, three years out, coping with continuous anemia in this example and um, other things. But I think there seems to be an underlying theme with all everybody sharing these um, these experiences and these issues. It's important to connect to people with others yeah. with the same lived experience as to how they cope and how the group and combine knowledge. So I think I'd like to thank you very much and everybody for giving their, their, their points. If I was to run through a little a few slides, some of you may already know about these, others may not, but this recording will be made available to you, to you um, and uh, when we follow up um, after, after this event. So if, if it's okay with everyone now, I'll um, cut the questions and answers to, to a close. And I'll, I'll um, just run through some services that are immediately available to you and what the charity at Leukemia Care can do to help you and connect you with the support and the teams you might need. It does sound as this group is under supported massively. We know this. And I think you are a group that are out there, maybe sometimes not coping too well. And, you know, you need to be able to connect with people that can help. And that can be the charity itself or more importantly, the, the groups that the charity has brought, brought together to help you support each other and sign posts and, and share. So uh, if that's okay with everyone else now, I've overrun slightly, I'm gonna to be told off for this. So if you've got five minutes, please do bear with me. 
Um, I'll see if I can find my slides. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, so if you don't know about much about leukemia care, um, we provide quite a broad range of support services and resources to, that might be of help. So it's obviously webinars at the moment, um, we provide a regular newsletter and magazine. Um, we have podcast service as well that also shares education and supportive information. We're very active on social media, and that's also a good way of connecting to people. And please also do, if you get a chance, use the website because there is a wealth of information there for you. So if I was to run through a few things first, um, don't let the, the title of the next webinar scare you. I think planning ahead is important for all of us as adults. And it's something as, you know, us people that live with leukemias quite often don't visit or re-update, um, you know, preparing for the future because we don't necessarily want to address our own mortality at times. So it's it's an interesting webinar and it's an interesting service that you know I, I would advocate for for everybody to keep 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 the keep keep the, those services up to date. But more importantly, that might be relevant to people living with AML or AML. I don't know how many people on this call are post-transplant or post-treatment, but there are a couple of upcoming webinars that are ALL and AML specific that are looking at latest developments and advances. So if you've dropped in and you are you know, wanting to find about, about the latest treatments, um, please please do visit the website and you can, you can visit and, and also see what other web webinars are available. Most importantly, we provide information booklets that can help with guides that if you haven't finished a treatment or you're about to have a treatment and you've dropped in here, then there are booklets that we provide that are very much up to date that can help you with understanding about the different treatments and how they're used for the different acute leukemias and if that might be relevant to you. But more importantly, as, as Caitlin and Lisa, they flashed a little image, we also do have a guidance booklet about helping to live and cope with late effects. Um, that's available through the website. Support services. I mentioned earlier, um, we have a, uh, a helpline in place that's staffed by clinical nurse specialists with expertise in acute leukemias and follow up. And also that's supported by even simple things like a WhatsApp group. There's somebody on the end of the WhatsApp there for you. And there's a telephone support team that are always there to help signpost you to a team member within leukemia care or help you with what your issues may be. Virtual support groups I'll come on to in a second, but we have a national um, network of local and, and regional and different disease specific support groups where you can get together on a regular basis with people sharing the same experience. And at the moment, obviously because of COVID issues, a great majority of these are still virtual, but we're beginning to move back to face to face as well. So you get a chance to hook up with others with the same experience. And I know Ross has just posted in on there about some of these services. Um, we we do also have a welfare officer um, because obviously with current times this can be a challenge. So if you if you if you need to get in touch there, and we have the full advocacy support team, which I'll come on to in a second. Lisa and Caitlin mentioned online forums. We were actually um, streaming this session to our um, Leukemia Care Facebook uh, online group and we also have a buddy scheme which I'll talk to you about in a second and the counselling fund um, which is there to help anybody diagnosed with a leukemia regardless of when um, to cope with any emotional and psychological issues that you're having to manage. So coming to national support groups these are coming up if you're not if you haven't joined up and it's relevant to you, you know, if you if you are either looking to gain connection with others or give support to others, um, if you're long timers, then um, you'll be most welcome in these groups. So in April, we've got the National Acute ALL group um, and the APL group um, and also the AML group on Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, the 3rd of May, and then later in May, the BMT group as well. So that's a terrific opportunity for you to be able to hook up with everybody virtually and go from there. Um, if you want to find any other types of support groups, as I said, we've got a um, regional, a, a national network, 
And some of these are very local, some of these are broad hematology, some of these are disease specific, and some of these are national. So um, again, you can search through the website, very easy to do. Um, Ross mentioned the buddy scheme. Uh, thank you for that, Ross. Th this is a scheme that we've been running for qu quite some time. And if you're somebody with experience that wants to help somebody else, then you are also of great value. Or if you're somebody that wants to connect with somebody with the same lived experience, understands, gets it, you know, can help, you know, the two, two of you can help each other and share experience, please do also um, connect. Um, everybody's trained. And um, this is a real, <laughs> this is probably one of the greatest eureka moments for many people. If you've been isolated and you've been alone and living with the issues that you live and nobody else recognizes that, then you can be connected with the people that do understand. And some people become great friends. Um, so that's my answer to the, um, to the lady that's been asking for connection. Please do um, visit the website and you can get a direct route and connected. Um, our advocacy caseworker, very important. Um, I've stepped in today for our advocacy caseworker, unfortunately, because she hasn't been well today. Um, but she's there all of the time on the end of the phone for anybody that's got issues that they want some um, patient advocacy support to either liaise, if you're having problems connecting with healthcare, or if you want advice uh, or want understanding and signposting to different issues, we have a member of staff that there's permanently to do that within the, the, the advocacy team. And also there for you, um, I mentioned earlier, we have a welfare officer who's there to help, you know, in this current financial climate, if consequences of uh, your leukemia are causing issues where you're having to struggle, which I think many people are, again, get in touch because there are opportunities there for you. Um, Counselling, I think this is quite important. We talked about this here. Again, the information is available through the website. These slides will all be made available to you so you can get in touch. But, you know, we can offer up to six sessions with a counsellor if people would find that of, uh, of help. And I can attest to that. Um, I haven't gone through intensive uh, treatments like yourself. I went through chemo, but not that intensive. But, you know, it, it was something that massively benefited me, but I don't live with long-term issues like you do. So I think this is a service that maybe you could you could take advantage of if you if you wish. Um, as I pointed out earlier, the free phone helpline is always there. Um, it's open. Uh, there's somebody there for you during working office hours. Yeah. Um, if not, there are WhatsApp groups and things of that nature. So please do get in touch if you need to talk to somebody, want to talk to somebody, um, want to be connected. Um, and you can also directly email us. Um, I've mentioned very active on social media. It's another route to connect, a route to connect with others. If you want to get involved and help others and um, in your position to do it, there's plenty of other activities where community fundraising brings groups together. Um, that might be another opportunity to connect with others. And, um, you know, if that's your bag, and there are plenty of opportunities there to help others. Um, I think um, that's just about covered everything, and I apologise for overrunning. I'll stop sharing my slides, um, and I don't know if we've lost Lisa and Caitlin, um, but if you're still with us, I'd like to thank you ever so much for joining us and for providing the information. Um, we will follow up with everybody after after this session. We'll send out a feedback form to everybody else. I'd just like to thank everybody, you know, for taking the time and being very um honest and sharing some of the issues you're living with because i've certainly learned a lot from caitlin and from um lisa and um yourselves also so i think it's important that you have the opportunities to connect and and i hope we've gone some way to do this today so thank you for your time everybody yeah thank you everybody yeah thanks a lot everyone. thank you have a good day everybody bye bye bye, bye.